There's been little let up in the ongoing debate of so-called stand-your-ground laws since the George Zimmerman verdict in Florida last month. Activists occupied the Florida State House, and the issue has been raised in many other places as well. As the question of racial justice raised by the death of Trayvon Martin continues to be central to the conversation, as it should be, a fascinating take on the principle of stand-your-ground laws appeared in the Washington Post on Faith section. Its author you're familiar with, but if you're familiar with this show, Susan Brooks, this will wait, is a writer, a theologian who teaches at Chicago Theological Seminary. She has been with us on State of Belief Radio before, and I'm very pleased to welcome back Professor Thistlewaite to State of Belief Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Well, Susan, thank you. Um, In your article headlined, Let's Not Just Have Another Conversation on Race, you go right at the moral failings that are represented by stand-your-ground laws. Interestingly, you call such laws a temptation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, As a theologian, I expect you to use that word, but talk about it in this context. Well, let's take a figure like this. Um, since Florida's stand-your-ground law became effective in 2005, the rate of homicides that have been claimed to be legally justified in Florida has jumped 300%. Now, the right to self-defense is an important right. I mean, it, it uh, um, has been contested in the history of Christian theology. For example, Augustine, who is widely credited with coming up with just war theory, was not certain that even self-defense could be a reason for using force against another. Augustine Augustine says um, that you could only use force in the defense of the vulnerable other. Mm -hmm. But from Roman law, and especially the influence of castle doctrine, you're supposed to be able to defend your castle. Uh, It's also a reasonably patriarchal point of view, uh, since it's deemed to be an attack on the paterfamilias. Mm -hmm. But these two streams come together in Western law, and there is a right to uh, defend yourself in a reasonable manner from imminent danger. Now, what ALEC, the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, along with the National Rifle Association, did was to rewrite these laws so that not only is it not your home anymore, it's anywhere you are where you're not engaged in criminal activity. And the um, stand-your-ground laws also, for example, are uh, uh, named as a reason why George Zimmerman was not originally arrested, and then, of course, none of the toxicology, no drug testing, no alcohol testing, is available on mm-hmm. George Zimmerman. So then, of course, when you get to the court case, that's that's not there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trayvon Martin, who was killed, was tested. Yeah. So you've got a uh, a situation where someone who uses deadly force against another person is... Um, likely not to be charged with homicide if they can claim a, a much, much, much more expanded uh, understanding of self-defense. And it is clearly tempting people, the 300% figure jumps out at you, mm-hmm. um, to claim this in relationship to homicide. Well, so you guys, it's, it's, I, it's really dangerous, you know? I, I like the way you put it in the article. You you said that stand your ground laws create an environment where deadly force becomes a weapon of first resort as opposed to last resort. Yes, and I'm referencing there um, the last resort criterion uh, of just war theory. And, you know, it's always you're, you're in, been the case in self-defense, for example, that if you have um, a way to run away, that um, you are supposed to do that rather than use deadly force. That's, of course, in traditional mm-hmm. legal understandings of self-defense. But no, withstand your ground, um, that's not necessary. So you can use force and, in a lot of cases, um, get away with it. Now, not if you're an African-American woman, though, um, Marissa Alexander. And you know this case? Right. 
Uh, uh, yes, Marissa Alexander, Alexander, uh, Florida African American woman. She's got a restraining order out on her husband. Um, he uh, um, it nevertheless um, comes uh, to uh, she feels use uh, uh, the force against her that he has used in the past. She goes and gets a gun and fires into the air. Claimed stand your ground, and she was given 20 years. Yeah. She didn't shoot him. She just shot into the air. Yeah. And so it's, there's also a question, uh, well, in, in terms of the temptation, the temptation is also that it follows our fault lines on mm-hmm. race, on gender. So who gets to be considered worthy of using deadly force? Who's unworthy um, and more likely to be jailed for this. And that's a pretty clear example um, where the husband wasn't even injured, Mm -hmm. and yet uh, she's in prison for 20 years. And there's a petition campaign, and I hope people will seek it out on the web and sign a petition to get her very, very unjust conviction overturned. But you don't see Alec and the NRA rushing to arm battered women so that they can stand their ground, or to arm African-American teenagers who might be at risk from uh, Mm -hmm. self-appointed community watch people. That's not been the response. So is it, there's a, you know, our our structures of inequality um, are another way that this injustice keeps getting perpetuated. Susan, talk uh, a little deeper in theological terms about the question of morality when it comes to stand your ground. And in your article, you also tie that in with New York City's notorious stop and frisk policy. Yes. Well, and I'm, uh, uh, I hope uh, listeners have um, uh, seen the story about the uh, New York City off-duty African-American uh, police senior officer who was subject to um, a stop by two white uh, policemen before they realized who he was, and his perspective on that was pretty illuminating. Um, yeah, I think that, um, and I, I have gone further than that. I mean, I, I really do believe that stop and frisk, because as, um, for example, the American Civil Liberties Union and others have documented, it is so unequally um, applied in relationship to African American, Hispanic, primarily males, so some females. And so it's a, it's a strategy of intimidation, and it um, is a law that um, I think is basically unconstitutional because you're stopping and frisking people when you have that they've done anything wrong. You're not required to have any evidence of that. So um, it's violating people's civil rights, but doing so in a way that really, really seems to be designed to perpetuate suppressive um, racial, economic, and gender um, so, force in our society. And, and you know, the, the concept that you are um, entitled as a person who is employed to keep the peace, to harass people in this way. I cannot imagine, but that is not bad for the character of the people who suddenly feel this sense of entitlement, that they don't need particular evidence to be able to do this to people. That's kind of bad for people's character. Mm-hmm. And it will tempt you to the lowest uh, forms of behavior. I don't want to be pessimistic, but... Too often in our country, it seems the debate on public safety, just like on immigration or war making, devolves into a primitive cowboy level of rhetoric. More and more, we see lawmakers descend to that level also. So, Susan, how do you discuss just war theory with people uh, who are chanting all the while, USA, USA, or Zimmerman, Zimmerman. I mean, how do you counter that? Uh, It's worse than than you think, Walton. Um, In the 1980s, the first of these laws that then became Stand Your Ground laws were nicknamed Make My Day laws. Mm, mm, So that the very much betraying um, that kind of cowboy uh, 
ethic mm. uh, from Clint Eastwood films. And, um, you know, Clint Eastwood in those films wasn't just shooting at an empty chair. Right. Um, so I think um, that, that when tempers are hot, is not a good time for peacemaking. Um, and that I think what we need to do is from the schoolyard in terms of peer bullying to our college campuses, to our workplaces. People need to be far more intentional about nonviolent communication, about anti-bullying, and those kinds of actual practices, and you know how long I have worked on the Just Peace Paradigm, and how the Just Peace Paradigm is based on 10 practices that tend to reduce violence and reduce the risk of war and increase the possibility for peace. There's nothing you can do except try to separate people um, who might get into an argument when tempers are hot. That's not the time. Um, The time is in our social locations, our school locations, our work locations, our radio communications. Mm -hmm. You know, I do a lot of radio, and so do you, and people... Uh, and I do a lot of online blogging. People just post the most appalling things, right. um, especially when they, uh, it's another form of temptation, I think, when mm-hmm. they can do so anonymously, um, because then they get to escape responsibility. And what is temptation, right? What is temptation mm-hmm. but thinking you're not going to have to be accountable? And so we need to practice nonviolent communication. We need to practice good, affirming, listening. We need to practice anti-bullying, and whether it's online or whether it's in the radio or whether it's in the workplace, wherever it is, that's the time, because this is, this is a social transformation um, that I think we desperately need in this country, but it's, it's a grassroots change that has to come. And there's a lot of parents, and I'm a grandparent now, and I think to myself, do I want my baby grandchildren to grow up in this world where they have to be afraid of being cyber-bullied? You know, mm, yes. every parent, every grandparent, everyone who cares about children can be invested in changing these forms of communication. And there are wonderful, um, like Peace Games and, and other groups who work on um, getting kids to learn different schoolyard behaviors. Mm-hmm. And um, there are a lot of teachers and principals, I think, who would be really, really interested in having this kind of communication learned in their schools. So that's where we have to start. You, you really can't get there from here when people are screaming at each other. You need to kind of send people to their rooms and say, calm down, and then uh, try to come at it. Uh, And, you know, our churches, our um, synagogues, our mosques, I'm actually working with a group of people in the United Church of Christ where we're going to put together a workbook for um, trying to help our churches. Uh, wouldn't it be great if our churches learned nonviolent communication mm. so when they were making a budget, <laughs> they would communicate well? I mean, yeah. I don't think there's a pastor in the United States who wouldn't want to sign up for that. Right. So, um, so I think that's, and you know, the best way um, to teach communication is how you communicate with people. Right. The Reverend Dr. Susan Brooks Thistlewaite is professor of theology at Chicago Theological Seminary and a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Susan's writing appears frequently in the Washington Post and elsewhere, and I encourage you to take time to read her column, Let's Not Just Have Another Conversation on Race. It was published on July 22nd in that edition. We'll link to it from stateofbelief.com, and you can find it there as well. Susan, you're always right on target, excuse the pun. Uh, I really feel that uh, you've brought a much-needed and well-articulated perspective to this timely debate, and uh, as always, I appreciate you being with us on State of Belief Radio. Well, thank you, Reverend Gaddy. It's, it's, you know, the work that you do helps people heal. Uh, yep. from the kinds of uh, tears in the social fabric uh, mm-hmm. that we experience so much today. And so I want to thank you for that. 